go over a couple announcements and a couple that aren't and so uh don't forget wednesday is our still continuing our membership class and so we be, should be finishing up that class this week and that's at uh, 6 30 on wednesday night still interested in becoming a member of the church but you weren't able to attend please talk to pastor josh and he can make arrangements for that and then as the weather is warming up, so is the water going away. And so if you're able to donate any water, we'd certainly appreciate that. And uh, also not in your bulletin, today, right after uh, service, be a worker uh, meeting for children's workers. And so uh, if you're interested in helping working in the children's department, whether it be um, Sunday school, VBS, children's church, 
Uh, all those things, today is a meeting over here in the Sunday School Room right after service this morning. And so if you'd like to be part of that, then also on May the 11th, the Pioneer Club is putting on Taco Thursday. And so they're going to be uh, selling taco, a taco dinner for a fundraiser for kids camp. And so there's a list of items on the back if you'd like to help donate food or the, uh, the fixings for all that. And so if you look at that list back there and sign up so they have an idea who's bringing what, that would help them out a lot. And so hear more about that next Sunday. And uh, it's $10 a plate for two ground tacos, rice and beans, iced tea or lemonade. You can't go wrong with that. Never can go wrong with what? And dessert. You can't go wrong with tacos, no matter what it is or where it's at. So, all right. So with that, I think we're going to go to the Lord in prayer then this morning. Father God, we're truly blessed to be in your house this morning, Father, and we have come and gathered in your name to worship you. We pray, Lord, that you calm our hearts, calm our minds and our thoughts this morning, Lord, that we may truly worship you this morning as we sing these songs of praise. Help us to pay attention to the words, Lord, and, and that uh, it will bring you honor and glory, and you in turn will, will give us strength and help us, Father, this morning. We pray for those that aren't with us today, Lord, those that are sick, that you lift them up and encourage them, or those that are traveling, that you protect them and be with them, and those that aren't here for whatever reason, Lord, that only you know about, we pray that you'd bless this morning and everything that is said and done in your house today, Lord. For we just ask it in that name, the name of Jesus this morning. Amen. All right, so if you're new here this morning, we are so glad that you're here. And then when you came in, you got a bulletin. And on that bulletin is this sometimes easy to tear off piece of paper and sometimes not. But if you'll tear that off, put your name and address on there or any information. If you have prayer requests or you'd like to know more information about our church, if you'd fill that out and drop that in the offering plate when it comes by. Um, so we get to know you better. And for right now, we're going to ask everyone to stand again and shake hands with those folks around them and let them know how great it is to be in God's house this morning. Amen. We should be able to say that we're drinking from the saucer because our cups are full and overflowing this morning. Amen. As the ushers make their way forward this morning, we're going to wait on you for God's tithes and our offerings. Father God, it's truly a blessing to be in your house today and Sing these songs of praise, and Lord, as we come to this part of the service, we would ask, Lord, that you bless the gift and the giver today, and for those that aren't able to give, we pray that you bless in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen.
I invite you to stand with me again if you're able to as we read from God's Word. And this morning we're reading out of a couple places. First one being Psalm 86. It says, For you are great and you do marvelous I might rely on your faithfulness. And give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths and from the realm of the dead. And over in Isaiah 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so is higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As do it without watering the earth and making it blood, uh, bud and fish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to his word this morning. Should be all of our desire this morning. It was just a closer walk with thee. Father, we thank you for another day that we can meet here as a church family and we can gather at your feet together. Lord, we want to be near you. That's why we worship. I come here for church, not because I have to be here, but because I want to. I want to be here. I want to worship you. Lord, we love you. I can say you're the refuge and the strength in my life. You're the treasure I seek, and you mean more than anything to me. And I pray that it comes out of my life. Help us to not just come in here on Sunday morning and get so caught up with other stuff that we don't truly worship you. Forgive us for the times that, uh, and the ways that we, we get distracted with the details and the difficulties and demands of our lives. We get so distracted with the pain that we're feeling or the burdens of our physical problems. We get so distracted with the struggles that we're up against or what we're going to have to deal with tomorrow. And God, sometimes we get so distracted that we fail to worship you. But I want to thank you that when we do worship you, you seem to just wash all that stuff away. Help us to really worship you and to realize that the one who created all that there is, the one who sustains this world, Jesus Christ, the one who left that tomb empty, is in this very room. You're on the throne, but you're in this room, listening to our praise, and you want to know for you. When we truly praise your name, you're here, close enough to touch. Teach us to truly worship you. Grant that this will be a church who has learned to worship you. I pray that today each one here will somehow come to realize again that you truly are the friend of the wounded heart and they'll discover you in a victory that they've never had before. Lord, we want to lift uh, Roger up to you and Mary's family and friends. I ask that you'll comfort each one of them and that they'll feel your mighty presence with them. Give them the strength that they'll need these coming weeks and months. Thank you for blessing this church family with Mary and Roger. And thank you for sending people here to the church. Continue to bless us, Lord. Pour out your strength here. Teach us to be the church you want us to be. I thank you and I trust you and I ask that you'll move in close today. And we pray these things in the mighty, loving name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Are you glad to be here today? I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're here. Uh, as most of you have probably heard, Mary Soderman went uh, home to be with the Lord yesterday morning. From what I understand, she's been fighting health issues for a long time. And uh, 
we saw how see she would soldier through a lot of these health issues and uh, we're all gonna miss her but uh, she doesn't have to fight anymore and I'm glad she knows Jesus and uh, she told me she was ready so uh, as soon as we hear anything about services for her we'll let you know uh, I talked to Roger this morning he wanted me to tell you all that he loves you and appreciate your prayers and uh, he said, um, don't worry, you'll see me at church again. So, yeah, he wanted you to know he's, he, he's coming back. Well, last week we had our voting <clears throat> for the church board positions. Uh, I want to introduce to you our church board this year. But first, I feel we need to show our appreciation for the ones who served on the board this last year. So when I call your name. If you would just stand real quick while you're out, while you're up there, and uh, we can say thank you uh, for your service here at the church. So Nazarene Missions International, Jan Bruton. She took off. She left. We'll clap when she comes walking back in. Uh, Sunday School um, and Discipleship Ministries International Superintendent, Minerva Johnson. Church Smith. Thank you for your work here at the church. And they've all said that they're still open to helping out where they can. So we're going to hold them to it. Uh, and then uh, our church board for this year, if you would please just stand right where you're at. Uh, when I call your name, Rod Siemens, Don Dickinson. And uh, Ron Norman is out of town today, yes? Okay. Um, and John Harris, who is also our board secretary. Church stewards, Kayla Harris, Kim Wood, who is also our SDMI superintendent, and Jesse Harris, who is also our church treasurer. That's an amazing group of kids there. I, I come in here once in a while, see what's going on. And I'll tell you, I walked in when they were worshiping in here. And I'm telling you, they were worshiping, worshiping their heads off in here, if you want to say. And they were not kidding around. They weren't playing around. They were worshiping God in here, singing to them. It was, it was an awesome thing to see. Uh, and so I, I appreciate them also. And I feel blessed for the, the workers there also. Anybody? Okay, well, let's go ahead and... Uh, Grab your Bible and turn with me to the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. And uh, we'll begin in verse 35. In Matthew 9, we see some miraculous occasions that uh, uh, show the power of Jesus and his ability to, uh, who would come to him and and uh, taking just a quick look at the day and the life of Jesus, just in, just in this chapter, uh, Jesus heals a paralyzed man that was brought to him by some other men. Uh, he calls Matthew to be his disciple. He raised a, a synagogue leader's daughter back to life. He healed a woman who... Uh, had a, a uh, bleeding issue that she suffered from for a long time. He gave sight to two men who uh, were blind. He cast a demon out of a man who was mute and made him uh, able to speak again. It says that Jesus went through the towns preaching the gospel and he healed all kinds of sickness. And that brings us to our passage today. Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 35. You ready? Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. 
Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Here's the question for us. Is the church like Jesus? What if it was? Think about that. May God bless the reading of his word. Uh, now, we talked about this before. Maybe some of you remember, but I thought, man, what a great thing to talk about again. What would happen if the church began to deal with people in our community right here in Fort Mojave the way Jesus would deal with people in our community? That's an important question because what God will rescue from this world, you will ever take with you won't be your spoon collection, your car, your house. It'll be. Last time we looked at for God so loved the world, and, and when you think about it, it really isn't so hard to love the world. It's just that neighbor that makes all the noise so late at night, and their dogs that keep digging up your flower bed, right? I mean, as long as we talk who uh, we don't really encounter daily or, or even weekly, that's pretty but when we start talking about that person that you see at work every day who just drives you up the wall, another story, isn't it? People are strange, aren't they? Don't start pointing around the room. But I think we can agree that people are, are kind of strange. They spend money they don't have to buy things they don't need to impress people they don't like. True. People want to sit in front of the bus, they want to sit in the back of the church, and they want to be in the middle of the road. <laughs> Just a bit strange. But, you know, the people that Jesus met were strange too. But Jesus loved those people, and that's what I want you to catch today. Even though people are strange, Jesus loves people. Matthew chapter 9 gives a, a great picture of that. And, uh, we get this uh, great picture of how Jesus interacted with people. I mean, talk about a busy schedule. I mean, he did so many things just in that one chapter it talks about. But what would happen if we, as a church, as Christians, began Jesus Acts? I want us to go over three different lessons on what it looks like when the church or the individual believer begins to act toward people the way Jesus acted toward people. Uh, first of all, when a church or a believer begins to really act like Jesus they see people the way Jesus sees people. Now notice verse 36 of our passage. It says, when Jesus saw the crowds. When we become like Jesus, we begin to see people the way Jesus sees people. How did Jesus see people? Well, if you were to boil it all down, when Jesus looked at people, he always looked beyond the outward toward the inward. He looked beyond the externals and he, he would look at their heart and in their life. And today, we, he, he would look beyond that new car in the driveway. He looked beyond that giant screen TV in the den or the, main ca the man cave or whatever. Beyond the material stuff. And, and he'd see what was going on in your heart. Jesus always looked beyond the outward toward the inward. So let's look at three things that Jesus saw when he looked at people. First of all, when Jesus saw people who, he saw people who were disturbed. Verse 36, uh, he said they were harassed. And that word harassed that's used here describes someone who's uh, getting pulled in different directions and they don't know what to do and what to invest their life into. Uh, they're harassed and disturbed, just like a lot of people in our society today are disturbed. I mean, people are being pulled in so many different directions that we, they don't know what to do with their lives. If you ever speak to uh, people who don't usually attend church, uh, you'll probably hear them say something like, well, when Sunday morning comes around, I, I feel so beat up from the week. I, I need that day just to recuperate. They say, you know, that's my only day off for recreation, so I'm not going to go to church in so many directions they're disturbed by life can you relate to that 
Not only did Jesus see people who were disturbed, Jesus saw people who were discouraged. Verse 36 again, they were harassed and helpless. The word helpless that's used here is a term that basically means to be thrown to the wolves, if you would. They were in trouble and they couldn't help themselves. They were, they were so discouraged. What you find when you move out of your comfort zone and, and you begin to interact with people who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you'll find people who are so discouraged. And then the third thing that Jesus saw people who were disordered. And what I mean by that is that they were lost and they didn't even know it. Verse 36 again, they were like sheep without a shepherd. Have you ever heard of a judoscope? Used in animal herding. A judoscope will lead the sheep right to the slaughterhouse. You see, the sheep will follow anything or anybody. And so they get this Judas goat, and it'll lead the sheep right to the slaughterhouse, and the sheep will walk right in there and literally run to their death because they follow anyone or anything. And that's so true in our society. People will follow anything and anyone, and that's why things like uh, Jonestown can happen, or Heaven's Gate, or the Branch Davidians Massacre in Waco, Texas. The reason we have things like that happen is because we have people who are so disturbed and so discouraged and so disordered in their lives. People in this community who are disturbed, discouraged, and disordered and lost, and they don't even know it. I asked uh, someone if they were saved, and they said, saved from what? There's people who are lost in sin and going to hell, and they don't even realize it. They're so disordered in their lives. When Jesus looked at people, he noticed that. He was able to look past their externals and, and uh, that we so carefully put up to see that people really were disturbed, discouraged, and disordered. There was a survey that was done a, a, a while back, and they were trying to find out, do most people think that they'll go to heaven when they die? And so uh, they asked people, do you believe that you'll go to heaven? And they found that one half of 1% expect to go to hell upon their death. 64% of the people who were asked said, I expect to go to heaven. 5% said they will come back as another life form. And 5% that said that they will uh, simply cease to exist. 24% said they have no idea. But the majority of them thought, hey, I'm going to go to heaven. Uh, when you come to into your life and you look at your past, and as long as you are good and it, the good outweighs the bad, uh, you get to go to heaven, right? And, you know, sadly enough, many people in churches today believe that way. It's not a matter of uh, what you've done that's going to get you into heaven. It's a matter of what Jesus has done to get you into heaven and whether you've accepted him or not. And yet we have people who are so disordered that they don't know the truth. When you look at people, do you see people who are disturbed, discouraged, and disordered? That's what Jesus sees. And if we're going to be a church that acts like Jesus acts, then we need to begin to see people the way Jesus sees people. But not only do we need to see people the way Jesus sees people, we need to begin to feel for people the way Jesus feels for people. Notice verse 36 again with me. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And the word compassion here means to have empathy for, to really feel deeply for someone. So when Jesus looked at people and he, he saw them as sheep uh, without a shepherd, he felt their pain. He, he felt their emptiness. Uh, when Kim was pregnant uh, with Cheyenne, she'll tell you, and she'll laugh when she tells you. She got a kick out of it. But I would experience what's known as sympathy pains. Have you ever heard of that? I would actually have morning sickness while she was pregnant. 
can smile about it now, but it sure wasn't funny back then. Sometimes she'd say, I feel fine. I don't know what your problem is. Um, so I don't know if you've ever experienced that. But uh, maybe you experienced with your kids when they got hurt or sick to their stomach. Well, Jesus was the kind of person who would look at people and he felt deeply. And the term that's used here is a term that means to have your guts tied up in knots. And Jesus felt for people. He felt all torn up inside for people. And that's what he's saying here. Now, I, I want you to notice something in verse 35 and 36 that can be this can be life changing. Look at those verses with me. And if you brought your own Bible, you can underline some things. OK. Verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages. Now you can underline that word went. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Verse 36, when he saw, now you can underline that word saw. When he saw the crowds, he felt or had compassion. You can underline those two words, felt or had compassion. He felt or had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You've just underlined the word went, saw, felt or had, and the word compassion. Now, how can you and I develop the kind of compassion in our lives the way Jesus has for other people? Well, look at the words you just underlined. Jesus went, Jesus saw, Jesus felt, Jesus had compassion. That's the process. When Jesus went, he saw. When he saw, he felt. When he felt, he had compassion. The problem for a lot of churches is so often we want to have that feeling for them, but we don't want to go and see. We don't want to get involved in their lives. We'd rather stand back and go, oh, I feel for people. Jesus went, Jesus saw, Jesus felt, Jesus had compassion. We say, Lord, give me a heart for lost people, but we don't want to go out there where the lost people are. If you want to have a heart like Jesus, you go, you see, you feel, and then you'll have compassion. When you really get involved, when you stop long enough to get in people's lives and see what's, what's happening and feel what they're feeling, you'll develop a compassion that comes from the throne of grace that God will use. That's what Jesus did. And, and when the church acts like Jesus did, and when believers act like Jesus did, then we go and we see and we feel, and then we'll develop compassion. Well, then the third lesson on like Jesus is this. Not only do they see people as Jesus for people the way Jesus feels for people, but they also respond to people the way Jesus responds to people. You see, Jesus wants to make sure that we don't just see the needs and even feel for people. He wants us to respond to people and respond to their needs because just to see the need and even feel the need isn't good enough. We've got to do something about it. When uh, one of your kids would get sick with a stomach ache, you could see that and you could feel really bad for them. But what they really need is for you to give them some 7-Up or pepto -Bismol or something like that, right? That's what they needed. You and I can see people and we can even feel for their problems. But what God wants us to do is somehow get involved and to and do something about it. So how do we respond? How do we respond the way Jesus responded? Well, Jesus responded in four ways that I see in this passage. Four ways to respond the way Jesus responded. First of all, it's this. We need to recognize the possibility and the problem. The possibility is this. Jesus said, verse 37. Verse 37, he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful. There's possibility out there. All kinds of opportunity. But there's a problem. The workers are few. 
Jesus said, you've got to recognize that there's a huge possibility out there. But the bottom line is there's not enough people getting involved. And Jesus is, is saying to us today, I have, a, I have people in, in Fort Mojave. You see them all the time. There's a huge need in their life, but I don't have enough workers who get involved in their life. I need more workers who will take the time to call them or send them a, a text message and, and care enough to get involved. I need more people who will get involved in a ministry in the church uh, or, or to work with the kids. I need more people to work with the teens. And some of them are headed for heartache and headed for hell unless someone gets involved in their lives. The possibilities are huge, but the workers are few. And if we're going to respond the way Jesus wants us to respond, then we've got to recognize the possibility and the problem. Secondly, we need to remember to pray. Look what Jesus said in verse 38 now. He says, says ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. In other words, we should be praying, Lord, send workers. Send people out to reach our community. Send me to reach our community. Send my family. Send my neighbors. Get us involved. That should be our prayer. We ought to be praying for uh, God to send more workers to Christian Joy Church of the Nazarene, to where we can have the kind of ministry God wants us to have, to where we can touch people the way he wants us to touch people. Then third, respond personally. We've got to get involved ourselves. Uh, look over at chapter 10, verse 1 now. Matthew 10, verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. In other words, Jesus tells them, well, now that we've prayed and now that we've seen the possibilities, it's time to go. He told them they, they had to get involved personally. That's what he's looking for. And then the fourth thing we need to do is, is this. Receive the power. Chapter 10, verse 1 says that Jesus gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And look at what Acts 1, verse 8 says. Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. If we don't have the power of God in our lives, then what we do will be useless. We need his power in order to do his work. Have you asked Jesus Christ to so consecrate your life that you've received his power? Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit and transformed and empowered for his kingdom? We can make a difference in people's lives for Jesus Christ. God's uh, made all the resources available, us, available to us to do that. The question is, have we received by consecrating our lives to him the power of God in order to do it? There's people in our community who desperately need for this church and for us personally to act like Jesus acted. Are you filled with his power and ready to do it? God's looking for people who will respond. The question for us today is, are you going to be a believer who acts like Jesus acts? Are we going to be a church who acts like Jesus acts? Let's stand together as we close in prayer. <laughs> Father, I thank you for the opportunity to get involved in touching people's lives. Thank you for your love and the way you work through us. Help us to make sure we're doing the right, uh, doing work for, for the kingdom. I, I thank you for the ones here whose hearts have been made tender by your word, and they realize they've got to start seeing people the way you see them, and they've got to start responding to people the way you do. We don't respond by just sitting back and hoping that someone else would get out there and get involved. Prepare us for ministry. You tell us to pray for workers to go out into the harvest field. So as a church, we pray for workers. We pray for believers. 
but also that you'll continue to bring them here, church family. Bless them and use them. And as you do so, help us to listen to your Holy Spirit's leading in all that we do here. Show us when, uh, when and, and how to touch and, and, and when and how to speak and when to keep our mouths closed and just be there and listen. Prepare us for ministry as a church. Make us soldiers in the army of the Lord. Soldiers that you can use to touch the enemy territory. Give us the power we need to, to act the way you act. There's a community here that needs you. So we praise you and we thank you and we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In Him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. God bless you as you go today.